Let's take a look at another class of iterable object in Python, and that is the list structure. Okay, a list is the most like an array. Uh, it could be used synonymously with array in languages like C++ or Java or PowerShell. So let's look at the, the capabilities and limitations of a list iterable. Is it changeable? Yes, you can add and remove items. Is it indexed? Yes, in square brackets. You can have the index and subscript value and specify an element numerically. Is it ordered? Yes, items have a defined order. Doesn't change, so uh, they're ordered sequentially. They're not you know, retrieved in a random fashion as would be with a set type iterable. Do they allow duplicates? Yes, items can have the same value in a list. Usage, like other iterables, to store multiple items in a single container or an encapsulated container of inner containers, if you want to think of it that way. Um, what is it most similar to? Other iterables like tuples, sets, and dictionaries. They're created with the square brackets again. Um, unlike C++ arrays, uh, you know, uh, a Python array or list can hold objects of different data types. So you could combine strings and integers and booleans and things like that. Um, methods. As with other iterables, many other iterables, it has the len method, append, remove, extend, insert, index, pop, clear, sort, and copy. Okay, a lot of these methods are used, can be used interchangeably with other classes of iterables in Python. You'll see these same methods over and over. So let's just look at instantiating uh, a list. So to create a list, to instantiate it, I just define it. I give it a name, the assignment operator, and then in square brackets, I would put in my elements. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five, and six strings are being created inside this list. I can display the whole list at one time. And as with other types of iterables, I could plug it into a for loop or repetition structure, and I could go through it element by element. And if I do it this way without using range and the len method, if I just use a, a very simple for loop, it's just going to display each item. X would not be uh, an integer value that could be used in an index and subscript. I, I'd have to use range and len, and we'll do that later. But in a simple for loop like this, X is the actual object. It points to the element itself, which you'll see, right? So if, if I run this method, I'm going to add a 5. And so you can see, I'm using my counter variable, and I'm incrementing it here, and then I'm just displaying it. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Tali, Sparkle, Fluttershy, Rainbow Dash, Rarity, Applejack, and Pinkie Pie. But this X here in this very simple repetition structure, or for you, is just pointing to the element and displaying the element object itself. Let's look at using the len method. We've used this with other iterables. It just returns the number of elements, the number of objects stored in the list. I hit F5. When I call length, number of objects in the list is, and that's very useful for writing dynamic code. That way, when you update your lists, say you append, add items to, or remove items from the list, you don't have to worry about modifying a thousand hard-coded values elsewhere in your code. If you just use the len method, then everything's dynamic. Everything's automatically updated, and your for loops and so forth in your code, anytime you modify the size of a list, makes it a very, very useful method, right? Unlike with tuples, you don't have to use a trailing comma if you want to create a list with one, just one element. And, and it's changeable. You can modify it. You can add an element if you want to. So here in this list and this list, look. In both cases, these are lists. This next example illustrates that you can hold different data types in a list, right? We have a string, an integer, and a bool. 
different data types to find in a list. We could even hold different classes that we defined, you know, instantiated objects inside a list if we wanted to. But as with any other iterable, we can plug it into a repetition structure or for loop. We're calling it disorganized chaotic loosey goosey objects with different data types because that's what this list is. We'll go through and we'll use a counter variable and we're going to typecast or convert to a string. So we'll parse it to a string here. And then we'll display the value. And we're just going to iterate through our loop. And we're going to use the format method with the print method. And this will just format our columns here. The syntax here will format our columns. But if I had a 5 and run function 4, so look at the, you know, in this case, the counter variable, the actual x, which is the, the element itself, right? Charlotte Sparkle 42 true rainbow dash. And look at the data type. Once we run it through the type method and then cast it to a string, and then we pass in these two strings here and format them in columns with format and the print method. So string, integer, bool, string, integer, bool, and our different data types. In this next example, we're going to use the append method. And with the append method, this shows that we can add items to a list. And we can remove items from a list if we want to. But using append, we'll add some items. So we have six strings here, and we're going to add two more strings, OK? So I hit F5. Before, here's our six strings. And then we use append, we add two more, and now we have eight strings, right? And if we use the lint method to count, we could return the length of those number of items. And now we're just going to do the opposite. We're going to use the remove method in this example. Hit F5 to run it. And now we have two less strings, if you look at the before and the after, OK? In this next example, let's take a look at using the insert method, OK? And insert works a bit like append, but whereas append just tacks on what you add to the very end of the list, insert gives you a bit more precision as to where you place your item. So we're going to add two strings to our list of six strings here. And just as with the pen, we'll add two more. But here we can, with insert, we can specify the index or the subscript position where we want to add that new element. And then all the other elements will just be shifted to the right. OK, they just be shifted to the right of that position where we add it. So if here, let's say, you know, element zero is Twilight Sparkle. I want to add a new string, Princess Celestia, and I want to add it at index position 0, which is the first element in the array. Then it would look like this. OK? I'd use the insert method. And then it would shift everything else to the right. OK? And then at position 4, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, remember the fence post issue. It's, it's indexed as 4, but it's actually the fifth element. So Applejack here, I want to insert Princess Luna where Applejack is. And then it would just shift those items to the right. OK, so let's see what happens when we run this code. All right, so look, we start out and we have Twilight Sparkle. Here we call insert and the insert method at position 0. We insert Princess Celestia, so it becomes the first element. And it shifts Twilight Sparkle to the right. And then we have Fluttershy, Rainbow Dash. And then we wanted to insert Princess Luna here at this position where Applejack is. So then what happens? Then Applejack and those elements get pushed to the right. OK? So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, Princess Luna. Hi, Sebastian. That's my cat, Sebastian. OK? And then Rarity, Applejack, Pinkie Pie, Princess Celestia, Princess Luna get pushed to the right. So just an example of insert, which gives us more precision, allows us to specify the index of where we insert an element. And Sebastian's adding his two cents. 
In this next example, let's look a bit more at how the index and subscript syntax works with a list inside those square brackets. So remember there's that off by one issue. So yeah, we could have six elements, but they would be indexed as zero, one, two, three, four, and then five. What happens if I pass in a negative value? Well, that would simply wrap around. So if I map my, you know, here if I map my element zero and then I do negative one, I'd wrap around to Pinkie Pie. Negative two, I'd wrap around to Applejack. Okay, let's, let's take a look at that. We'll run this example here. Clear the console, hit F5. All right, so negative one, if I'm here at element zero and that's Twilight Sparkle, negative one wraps around to Pinkie Pie, hence Pinkie Pie. Negative two to Applejack. Another part of list syntax is specifying a range of values. So numerically, we can specify the index subscript value in square brackets. And remember, there's always that off by one issue. So we might have six elements in an array, but it would be numbered sequentially zero to five. Even though there's six, it's off by one, right? We don't start at one. Computers start at zero, okay? So that happens with arrays with list type objects. And in this case, if we were to use length, we could display there's eight strings, okay? Eight strings here. Oh, and let's make sure we're running the latest edit of this function here, F5. All right, so there's eight, see, eight, we're running length here. Then let's, let's do a range. So zero, one, two, right? It's the third element, but it's indexed, has a subscript value of two, and that would be rainbow dash. And let's go to six, but off by one, that would, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, but one less Pinkie Pie. So again, here, rainbow dash, Pinkie Pie. Two, one less than six, or, all right, so zero, one, two. And then look at four, seven. Zero, one, two, three, four. That's Applejack, right? And then seven, but one less than seven. Princess Luna, go back one, Princess Celestia. That's Princess Celestia. Let's look at our next one, zero, three. Zero, the first element, Twilight Sparkle. Zero, one, two, three, rarity, but back one would be Rainbow Dash. Here, let's look at six, eight, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, Princess Celestia. And then Princess Luna, okay? Let's look at two, three, and this next example, Twilight Sparkle. Zero, one, two. So there's the first three elements that would be in indexed zero through two. Let's look at this one, four until, all right? So zero, one, two, three, four. There's Applejack, right? And then Pinkie Pie, Princess Celestia, Princess Luna, all the way to the end. So just a way you could specify a range of values in a list, uh, you know, using a different syntax. Let's clear our console and take a look at the next example function. So here we create a list, all right? We've got eight strings and we can use, in this case, the n keyword. If we want to see if a string of value an object is contained within a list. So if I say if rainbow dash n MLP fem main cares, and is it, here's the value rainbow dash then if, if this returns true, if we find that value, yes, Sonic Rainbow. Otherwise, no, not in the list, right? Is Pinkie Pie in the list? Yes, party time. Otherwise, no, not in the list. Is Supercalifragilistic in the list? Yes, party time. No, not in the list. So using the keyword n to look for a particular value in the list, let's see what happens if we head F5 and run it. Again, yes, Sonic Rainboom, 
Yes, party time, not in the list. So yes, Rainbow Dash, yes, Pinkie Pie, they were both on our list, but Supercalifragilistic was not in our list. And that's just using the keyword N to search for an item or object within a list. In this example, let's take a look at the extend method with lists. The extend method can join uh, the elements of one list to another, or it can also take a tuple and join it to a list. And we'll look at examples of both. In this first example, we have two lists. And then on the main characters list, we call the extend method. And we pass on as a parameter or an argument the antagonist list. And let's see what happens uh, in the before and after. So after we use extend, it should combine all the elements from antagonist and then put them into MLP main cares. Let's hit F5. And again, here's our, our list MLP main cares. And notice that it effectively combined all the elements from list MLP main antagonist into list MLP main cares. Uh, let's take a look at 12. Now, 12 is, we're doing something similar, but here we have a tuple. Instead of joining the elements of one list to another, we're taking an entire tuple and we'll be joining it to our list here. So let me comment that function. All right, so our tuple, and clear the console here. And again, the elements of both lists have, have been joined together using the extend method. In this example, we're declaring a list here with six strings. And we're going to show unpacking. And unpacking is just sort of uh, code shorthand that you can do with any type of iterable object in Python by plugging it into a repetition structure like a for loop. But if we just iterate through the elements here, I'll hit F5. So for X and MLP main characters, again, we're just displaying everything in that list element by element. And that's known as unpacking. Okay, let's take a look at this example. Clear the console there. Um, and then a uh, list can be unpacked into individual variables. When we want to modify a value at a particular index or subscript, we just use the number. So if, if the first element here, right, Twilight Sparkle, that would be indexed to zero. Remember the fence post issue. If I wanted to change it to Discord, I would just take my square brackets and put zero in there you know, the index of the subscript value of the element that I want to alter. And then I could store this new value there. And that's what we're doing here, just a before and after we make that change. So let's illustrate that. Make sure I was running the right function there. Okay, so I hit F5. All right, so element zero was Twilight Sparkle, but now notice that it's Discord, All right? So again, just using that array list syntax of square brackets. And if I wanted to modify a range of elements, let's say from zero to two, All right? So if I would start at zero, then I'm gonna modify, instead of Twilight Sparkle, we'll replace it with Discord. And then one and two, um, and, and then remember, when we modify a range, anything that's that's in front of that, we shift it to the right. So let me hit F5 here. All right, so again, notice here, starting at element zero, Discord, okay, and then Lord Tyrick, and then Rainbow Dash, Rarity, Applejack, Pinkie Pie, as we had before, we just shifted them to the right, okay? 
In previous examples, we've seen how using the, the square brackets and index subscript values can be used to modify a value at a particular element in a list. But we can also use the insert method. And the insert method, in this case, let's say that at 0, 1, 2, rainbow dash, I want to modify that value and change it to discord. So clear the console. Let's head F5. Okay, and again, 0, 1, 2, that value is discord. 0, 1, 2 was rainbow dash. Now it's discord. And that's just using the insert method here. Takes as uh, parameters, and we'll pass in as an argument the subscript, the index, we want to modify the subscript value, and then what we want to change it or modify it to. Okay. Let's look at the pop method. Okay. And here we have the pop method. It removes uh, an item in a list at the specified index or subscript value. So we pass in two. So here's our list, 0, 1, 2. That's rainbow dash. We want to remove rainbow dash. OK. And then uh, if we call it without passing in an argument, as we're doing here, it'll just pop off the last element. So here we'll, we'll just show that we specifically specified the second element, 0, 1, 2, rainbow dash, and we remove it. But here when we call it without an argument, unlike how we did it up here, we're just going to chop off the last element, which should be Pinkie Pie. So let's clear the console and run this using the pop method. OK, notice that rainbow dash is gone because we specified the subscript value of 2. So 0, 1, 2, right? The third element, that was rainbow dash, and it removed her. And then down here, because we called pop and we, we didn't pass in any arguments, it just chopped off the very last element in our list, and that was Pinkie Pie. And so now there's, there's no more Pinkie Pie. Now we're going to use the delete method. If we use delete, we can specify a particular element in a list. And then, you know, in the square brackets, that index, that script, we, we can delete, remove that value. On the other hand, if we call delete here, we're getting rid of an entire list, OK, so the entire object. So let's run this code and see what happens. We'll hit F5. OK, so 0, 1, 2. Boy, Rainbow Dash is getting picked on today. But you know, notice Rainbow Dash was here. But when we call delete and we use the, the second uh, we, we passed in 2 as the subscript value, but that's actually the third element, right? 0, 1, 2. It removed rainbow dash. And here, we just cleared out and deleted the entire list. And if we tried to reference it after that, it would generate an error. It would be a problem. Matter of fact, let's illustrate that. So we delete it. What happens if we try to access it now? Again, I'm, I'm going to hit F5, run it. Boom! Why? Because it's a null object now. So, you know, this would be okay, but if we do this, we can no longer, we need to make sure that we're completely done with this list. And we don't need it any longer. Now, let's look at the clear method. This will clear all the elements in a list but without deleting the entire list. So you could still access it. Whereas this down here would delete the entire list. This would just clear the list and empty it of all of its elements. And let me go comment 20 out here and we'll run 21. All right, so let's look at calling the clear method now. Clear the console, hit F5 to run it. 
So after we call the clear method, you know, notice the number of elements in the list. It was six, but when we call the clear method, it becomes zero. And if I try to display the list, it doesn't create an error. It just displays an empty list. So, you know, clear it. It cleared all the elements, but it didn't delete the list. Let's take another look at using, um, uh, you know, iterating through a list without range and len. And then here we're going to use range and len, and we'll see syntactically how that's different. Okay, so without range and lint, x points to the element itself, all right? And if I display x, it's not a numerical value, it's the value of the element being pointed to inside of our for loop. If we're not using range and lint, the range and, and lint methods, just trying to illustrate that. Let's clear the console there. Let me hit F5 and we'll run this. Okay, and I had an external counter variable and I had to increment it, okay? And iterating through the loop, going through the loop here, you can see that when I print x, you know, I'm not printing an integer, it's not the index of the subscript value, it's pointing to the actual element, the object itself that's stored inside the list, okay? Now let's look at example 23. And this is different. We're also using a for loop in this example, but we're using range and len. And that changes things considerably, you know, logically and, and, and how things work. All right, so again, a for loop, we're iterating through our list, but we use range and length. And um, range takes several arguments. Uh, the first is where to start. The second is where to end. And the third is what to count by, how to increment. But if you don't supply all the arguments, the default is zero, okay? And length returns the number of elements inside of a list. So here I'm saying with range, for x and range, and since I didn't supply the beginning argument, I mean, I could have said zero, comma, and I could have said, you know, if I wanted to count by twos or count by threes or whatever, let me, you know, count by three or count by two or something, if I wanted to supply those arguments. But a lot of times those will be left out. And when they are, the default is always zero. So I start at zero and I go to the length of the number of uh, items inside of my list, right? MLP from main characters, okay? And then in this case, from zero to the very last element, Pinkie Pie. There's six elements, but because of the fence post, they're indexed as zero through five instead of counting one through six. Well, when I do it this way, X doesn't point to the actual object inside the list. It doesn't point to the element in the list. Instead, X is just an integer value that holds the subscript. And to show you that, I'm just using X, you know, again, X starts at zero by default. So I'm adding one to count one to six instead of counting to, you know, from zero to five. But it's just an integer now. It doesn't point to the actual object. To get to the actual object, the element stored in, in the list, I have to use array syntax. I have to use the square brackets. And I have to pass in an integer that references the index or the subscript value of the element that I want to reference, okay? And in that way, uh, doing a loop this way with a list or other type of iterable using range and len, those two methods, it, the syntax, the logic works as it would in other programming languages, such as C++ or Java or PowerShell. So it's just, just an option uh, when, you, when you construct a loop in, with an iterable using range and len. And again, let's, let's see how that looks on the console. Hit F5, we'll run it. So again, you can see this x, it's no longer pointing to the actual object. It's just an integer that references the index on the subscript. This is the actual object in square brackets, and it has to be referenced via a number, which we can use with range and len 
and then the, a default argument of zero to start at the very first element, and then len to go to the very end, which is the number of elements in our list, our iterable. And here on 24, we have a list again. And here we're just using a while true loop. And you know we need a, a condition. So while sentinel value is less than length, MLP fem main characters. So the sentinel value, that's, that's traditionally the value that when we reach that value, when we attain that value, that's where we break out of the loop, okay? It's to avoid using hard-coded breaks and continues and things like that, which can often lead to error-prone code and, and infinite loops, unintended infinite loops. So in this case, we, we coded it with a sentinel value. As long as sentinel value is less than the number of elements, right? Length returns the number of elements inside of our list. And then what happens? We're going to print sentinel value plus one, and we'll use that to index the subscript value of the elements, the objects stored inside of our list here. Okay, so we're doing the same thing we did above with the for loop. This is how we do it with the while true loop, and then we just need to increment, add one to the value of sentinel value. Okay, and if I run the code F5, see? does the same thing, but this is how you do it with a while true loop. And depending on how you like to code this, a lot of people would prefer to put this in parentheses, make it parenthetical, but it doesn't change what the code does. Just some people would, might consider that more readable. I don't know, it's a matter of preference. <laughs> Okay, um, let's look at some shorthand methods, all right, in these next few examples. So, let's go to 25. All right, so we have our list here. I could say this, if I put it in square brackets, print x for x and MLP main characters. And in this case, just a shorthand way on one line of iterating through that list, let me clear the console there. And we'll head to F5 and let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so in a single line of code, uh, that's just a sort of a shorthand way of setting up a repetition structure, a for loop, and iterating through all the elements in a list. So, you know, print x for x and MLP. We're just saying, you know, print the element, print the object in the list as you iterate through each single element in the list. Okay, in this next example, um, we're going to look at, at two different ways of doing the same thing. So, let's say that I wanted to iterate through a list that we've declared up here. Here's our list, six strings. And then I want to look for a particular value. And then if I find that value, I want to add that element to another list. So we have an empty list here, match results normal. So I would need an empty list here. I'd have to declare that. I'd need a repetition structure, a basic for loop, to iterate through all the elements in the list. I'd need a decision structure if y and x if we find y and x, and then what we're going to append that element to our new list here, our target list, our, our list that will hold the found elements. So in this case, at least four lines of code. But I could do the same thing down here in shorthand if I did it this way. Match results shorthand, all right? And then this is just going to be a list, z for z and MLP from characters. So I'm going to cycle through iterate through all the list uh, elements. And then if y is an element, if y and z, then that will become a part of this list. And then I can display the list. They both do the same thing, but this uses like four lines of code, and this only uses one line of code. So it's a short, just a shorthand method, but if I had a five, as you can see, the results are identical. All right, Fluttershy has a y, Rarity has a y. So the first time with four lines of code, that's that's what is added to our new list. The second time with one line of code in our shorthand method, same thing. 
Fluttershy has a Y, Rarity has a Y, and they're both added to the new list. But here we did it all in one line. So just showing you a shorthand method of doing that. Let's look at 27. And here we're going to look at matching another condition type. So we've declared a list. We've got six elements on our list. We're displaying the entire list here. And then M for M and MLP characters of M is not equal to Fluttershy. So basically any element in this list we're going to add to our new list that's being created on the fly here as long as it's not Fluttershy. So it should be every other character except for Fluttershy. Let's go run function 27 and see what happens. Okay, so I'll hit F5. Okay, again, here's every character except for Fluttershy. And, you know, we could have done that with a repetition structure, a, a for loop, range, lint. But instead of four lines of code, again, one line of code. So a shorthand method. Now let's use range to create and populate a list. Okay, so um, we have a list of numbers, A for A and range 10. Now remember, there's other arguments. I could say start at one. I could say start at five. And I could say, you know, count by two, increment by two. So I can pass those additional arguments into range if I want. But if I don't, then zero is implied. It starts at zero by default. So that's a quick way to generate a list with numbers, you know, uh, as we count our, our, our numbers zero and then one less than the ending element here. It's actually index zero through nine, but that's still 10 numbers just you know, we that we counted zero. Remember that fence post issue? Okay. And then here, in this case, B for B in range 11. So again, zero to, to 10, you know, it's one minus. If B modulus two, so in this case, we want even numbers. These are any numbers, but modulus operator two, these are gonna be even numbers, right? If there's no remainder, if what's left over is zero, then we know it's an even number. So let's run this. And did I indeed uncomment that? No. Let me uncomment the right function there. So we make sure we actually run function 28. <laughs> and I'll hit F5. Okay, and so see here's our 10 numbers, index zero through nine, because of the range method. And remember that that zero, well, that's that's a default, that's implied, unless we specify some other starting value. And then remember that this is, is off by one, all right? So 11, but that means it would stop at 10. And if the remainder is zero, you're using the modulus operator, if we divide on what's left over zero, we know it's even. And so that creates this list of even numbers here. But again, just, just two shorthand methods or quick ways of doing things uh, with lists and repetition structures. So it, what if we wanted to set all the characters in a list to uppercase, right? So here there's some uppercase and some lowercase, but if we wanted a quick way to set all these elements in our list to uppercase, we could do this. Um, we could create a new list and in this new list that we're creating, we could just say, in this case, C upper for C and MLP uh, fem main characters. And we're just gonna go through and just, this method here, upper, uh, converts everything to uppercase. And its opposite is lower, which converts everything to lowercase. So let's uncomment that and take a look. Okay. Twenty nine here. And we'll clear the console and let's hit F five. All right, so here we, we capitalized everything. 
And likewise, if I wanted to use the opposite lower, I'll hit F5 again. And in the first example, we uppercased everything. In the second example, we lowercased everything. Either way, but that just shows you, a, again, a shorthand method of doing that. Let's clear the console and we'll go run function 30. And let's look at setting all elements in a list to a specified value. So what if I wanted to replace all of these elements? And they're all different strings, but I wanted to make them the same value. I could use the same shorthand syntax technique. And in one line of code, I could say blank for D and MLP fem main characters if I want to do this. So let's go look at 30. You done comment that. And I'm going to hit F5 to run it. And we can see before, here's our main characters. And we can see after, all those values have been replaced with the string blank. Okay? So just again, another shorthand method of doing that. Let's look at setting all elements in a list to a specified value. A little bit more interesting logic here, or structure, but it's still on one line of code. It's still shorthand. We're going to say E if E evaluates to Fluttershy. Else, if not Fluttershy for E and MLP main characters, okay. So this list will become if if it evaluates to Fluttershy. But if it's not Fluttershy, it's just going to say not Fluttershy. So instead of Twilight Sparkle, Rainbow Dash, Rarity, Applejack, Pinkie Pie, if it's Fluttershy, it'll say Fluttershy. But the rest of these will be converted to simply not Fluttershy. But, you know, we're, just, we're doing all this on one line of code as opposed to four or five lines of code. So, again, another shorthand method. Let's uncomment function 31 so we can invoke it. And let's see what happens if we run it. Clear the console, hit F5 to run it. Okay, so Fluttershy remained Fluttershy. Because you know, in, in that particular instance, 0, 1 on the second element indexed as 1, E evaluated to be Fluttershy. But for everything else that was not Fluttershy, not Fluttershy became the value for every single element in our first list. So just, again, shorthand syntax. Let's look at sort using the sort method. So we can sort alphanumerically. It's ascending by default. And, and then down here, we'll look at descending, but let's just use sort by itself and, and use the default ascending first. So let's go uncomment function 32 so we can run our next example. All right. So here we have Twilight, Fluttershy, you know, they're in no particular alphabetical order. But if I call sort on this list, let's see what displays after. And we'll look at the before and after. All right, so now they're indexed. They, they've been sorted and rearranged alphabetically. So from A to T. Before, you know, just randomly as, as they were declared set up in the list. But now that we've sorted it, everything in that list, they're sorted alphabetically. And that could be integer values, too. So let's look at the next example here, 33. All right. So in the first example, it was strings. They were sorted alphabetically. Let's look at integers, list of ages, not sorted. Again, we're going to call the sort method. And when we do, what happens? Remember, the default is ascending. Head F5 to run it. So here they were in random, you know, random order in the way we created the list. But after we call sort in ascending order, then it goes from lowest to highest. So just notice that they've all been rearranged. Okay. Now, for a descending sort, uh, ascending is the default. But if you pass in the argument reverse equals true, then you can, you know, you can flip it. 
you can invert the sort. So instead of ascending, you can go in descending order. Instead of the least to the greatest, you could go the greatest to the least. So let's look at that. We've got, again, a list of random integers here. And let's, let me go and comment that function. Let's clear the console. F5 to run. OK. So now instead of the least to the greatest, we start at the greatest and go to the least. Why? Because, yeah, we're still using the sort method. But instead of the default ascending order, we passed in this parameter, this argument of reverse equals true. And so that flipped it, that inverted it. Instead of going from the least to the greatest, now we go from the greatest to the least. Just another way of, of using a sort and reversing it. Now, our last method here, we're just illustrating, as we've talked about with other iterables, you can't use the assignment operator to copy one list to another. But there is a copy method, OK? Um, so if I use copy, then basically I've declared a list here, and then I have a new list. And if I say MLP, some main character is my list that I built up here. If I call the copy method on it, it would just copy all the elements from that list to the new list. And then I just display it. So just showing you that that can be done. I'm going to hit F5. OK. Notice that my copy is an exact clone or duplicate of the original. And that's because I used the copy method. So I couldn't use the assignment operator. I couldn't say MLP of fem main characters is equal to copy MLP fem main characters. That wouldn't work. But it can use the copy method to clone all the elements and copy them into my new list. Well, I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. Uh, if you like it, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. And then when I make a new one, uh, you'll know. <laughs> Thanks for watching.